Preferential Policies, an International Perspective by Thomas Sowell. Where did you grow up? I grew up, I guess, in Harlem. I was born in uh, North Carolina. And your parents moved to Harlem? Yes. Where'd you go to school? And right in the middle of Harlem, PS5. And college? I went, went to Howard University in Washington for uh, a year and a half, and then I transferred to Harvard. Who, who most influenced you in your early life to become a student and then now a professor at Stanford? Oh, good heavens. Uh, there'd be so many people. I think my family itself would, would be uh, the biggest influence. When they came out of the South, their thought was that I would have opportunities which they had never had and that they wanted me to take advantage of it. And more than that, they realized that there was no way that they, either in terms of money or in terms of education, would be able to do that. And so they looked around for people for me to meet that would help me in some way. And there was a kid named Eddie Mapp that they had picked out for me to meet before I ever got off the train. You know, and uh, Eddie Mapp was from the West Indies, and his uh, mother was much more educated than the members of my family. And uh, Eddie Mapp began to tell me various things, such as that one school was better than another, which would not have occurred to me until it was too late. Uh, and that one could transfer so that one could get into a better school. And of course, I didn't. He, being, he was about a year older than me. And so I was, in effect, able to follow in his footsteps. And I learned about Stuyvesant High School in New York and took a test and got into there and so on. So I got a very good foundation, largely because of him. He introduced me to my first public library. I remember standing in this room with these tremendous numbers of books and asking, why are we here? Because I don't have any money to buy books. And then he had to tell me what a public library was. And I was about nine years old. Uh, and then once I tried it out, I was like, sounds like a good idea. When you got to education in the United States, mm. um, you talked about affirmative action. And you came up with some statistics that I wanted to ask you about. Well, I look for Here it is. Uh, you said that at the University of California at Berkeley, for example, where the entering freshman class has been described as, quote, wonderfully diverse, unquote, mm -hmm. because the, quote, class closely reflects, reflects the actual ethnic distribution of California high school students. These are your words. More than 70% of black students fail to graduate. Yes. Why? Because they're mismatched with Berkeley. That is, these students, the average black student at Berkeley is above the national average on test scores. It's just that the average white student is further above the national average, and the average Asian student further above than the white students. And so in that atmosphere, these students who have every qualification to succeed are artificially turned into failures. And the only beneficiary of that is the University of California at Berkeley. Because what they've effectively done is rented these bodies for window dressing for a few years. And then when they're through with them, they're put aside, and a new bunch of bodies are brought in. Have you told them that? Oh, yes. And what do they say to you? Oh, different things. Uh, I remember one fellow saying, oh, Tom, I'm just a little guy. I can't do anything about this. Which, you know, wonderful. But I really, the, people who, the people who really have the influence are not the people I've talked with. Uh, those people know exactly what they're doing. There's another group, I guess, that benefits from this. You have an establishment there, a black studies establishment, who need students to, man, to be in their classrooms, and these students serve those serve their purposes. The people who have political movements have people they can mobilize for those movements while those students are there. It's very much like what happens in athletics, that you have students who come in, as long as they can score touchdowns, the coach is happy. The fact that these students don't graduate is not the coach's problem. His problem is how to hold on to his six-figure salary and his job. And the students have to be sacrificed, then they are sacrificed. Let's take it first from the, uh, the uh, student standpoint. Of 312 black students entering Berkeley in 1987, all were admitted under affirmative action. Mm. You say that 70% of those fail to graduate. Mm. What would you tell those students to do under the circumstances knowing that statistic? I would tell them what I've told uh, students in general of all races to do, which is to go to schools that match your educational capabilities at the time because you need to be matched with a school. You, know, you shouldn't try to go to where the glitzy name is or what have you. Now, unfortunately, many of the minority students have such low income that they must go to wherever the money is. And the money is disproportionately at the kinds of schools that they will find very, very difficult to graduate from. All right, let's take it from the standpoint of the school. You're at the school and you want to do good. Mm. You say it doesn't work. What would you tell the school to do? 
who admit students on the basis of their qualifications. But what happens if they come up and statistically they have nothing close to the population? Well, they, they, won't, they won't have anything at, at, at the top level. But we have more than 3,000 colleges and universities in this country. Uh, every human being that's not severely mentally retarded is perfectly qualified to be at one of those institutions. I mean, there are institutions where if you can fill out the application form, you're qualified to do the work. And there are others where if you're not in the top 1 or 2%, your chances of making it are extremely slim. And it's precisely these second places that they want to send black students that they don't send white students of the same level of ability. And it's not at all surprising that they had to run into the academic problems they do. Let me give you another example that's not in the book. At MIT, the average black student is at the top 10% nationwide in mathematics and in the bottom 10% at MIT. And one-fourth of them don't make it. Now, when you realize how few black students at that level, to lose one-fourth of them, uh, you can't afford that. I think there's another larger loss that you have. You have the kid who goes to a top-level school, and he wants to be a chemist or whatever. And now he gets there, and he finds he cannot learn chemistry as it's taught at that school. It does not mean he can't learn chemistry. It means that if they have very high-pressure students, they can teach this stuff at a very fast rate, skipping on explanations, skipping over steps in the, in the mathematics, and these students will all pick that up as they go along. He may find that he can't keep up with that. And so in, in order to survive, he switches into some easy subject, which may be some ethnic studies program or what have you. And so someone who could have gotten a first-rate education at a good college ends up getting a third-rate education at a top college or ends up flunking out altogether. What's the state of prejudice in the United States today compared to, you know, earlier years in your life? It depends on the base year, like, like, like most comparisons. Uh, if you take 30 years ago, greater. Among, certainly greater among, in the academic world. Uh, in the book that I wrote about colleges, I urged minority parents not to think that because they had a good experience on a particular college campus 30 years ago, that their children will have that good an experience today because the racial tension is enormous on many campuses. Uh, the colleges themselves try to say that they're, they're victims of the racism of the larger society. And in point of fact, the racism on the campuses is greater than that in the larger society in many campuses. And what I worry about is that they're going to graduate into the general society, blacks and whites alike, who hate each other's guts, and who, who can be the leaders of new racial strife for the future. What's causing that on college campuses? One of the factors is the, pre the preferential policies. But it's more than just that, because that in itself sets in motion a series of events which add to the original resentment over the preferential policies. That is, you put yourself in the position of a black kid who comes out of a ghetto school, and he's gone through for 12 years with nothing but A's and B's, without a great deal of effort. And now he finds himself for the first time in his life in a predominantly white environment, and he finds that when he works twice as hard as he's ever worked, all he gets back for his work is a D. And that there are, and that there is also a minority establishment. This is true not only of blacks, but of minorities in general. Establishment which tells him, yes, uh, this, is, this is the racism on this campus. That uh, the, the, the white power structure is trying to keep you down. And it has to have a certain plausibility to it. Uh, it would have had a certain plausibility to me uh, had I come along in that era. Now, I was fortunate enough in one sense that uh, having grown up in the South and then transferred to New York, I was shifted between different levels of uh, education. And so I was a top student in my class in uh, North Carolina. And then I was immediately the bottom student in my class in Harlem. And I was way behind whoever was next to the bottom because the, the educational differences were was, was just that great. Very painful period of adjustment. But, it, but there was no racial issue involved since these were, all the other kids who were ahead of me were all black. And so I got through that. And then for a second time in my life, uh, I'd gone out on my own when I was 17 and I didn't return to college full time until I was about 25. Uh, for the second time in my life, I sh went into an environment that was very difficult compared to what I'd been used to. And once again, I was way behind. I was in danger of flunking out of the school the first semester. Where were you then? Harvard. Uh, it's really, it really is incredible to... You know, for the first time in your life, in 10 years, you're a full-time student, and you're a full-time student at Harvard without a high school diploma. Uh, <laughs> so there were little difficulties. And, and studying what? 
Uh, oh, at, uh, at that stage, I was studying uh, just general things, but I majored in economics, and all my, all my degrees are in economics. Uh, and again, an enormous adjustment to make, but there was no one there to tell me, all these white professors have it in for you, and that's why you're doing badly. Because first of all, I had done badly in Harlem, and I'd overcome it. I was doing badly there, and I overcame it. But What happened at the, you know, take that Harvard experience through, how long did you stay at Harvard? Well, I graduated. Graduated from Harvard. From I'm Harvard. sorry, I thought you said earlier you went to Howard. I went there for a year and a half, and then I transferred to Harvard. Oh, okay. See, All but right. I was going to Howard in the evening while working full-time during the day. Uh, so, this, so when I went to Harvard, I was a full-time student for the first time in 10 years. And uh, so that, that, that was... Uh, and what years did you go to ha Harvard? Remember? I graduated class of 58. Um, so that you can understand how the student would find this plausible. I talked to a black man recently, a lawyer, who said when he was in law school, he was told when he first got there that Professor X never gives black students more than the C. You know, and he got a B plus. But there was great consternation because one of the myths had fallen. But it's truly criminal what goes on in terms of using and manipulating the students uh, to serve all kinds of external purposes. Go back to uh, the campus again. What is creating the prejudice, other than the elites that you talk about that have their own, uh, I mean, what is it about, among people that uh, creates the differences that they don't get along? Well, the differences have always been there, but they got along before. I mean, blacks and whites were different at Harvard when I was there. But you didn't find all the black students uh, huddled together at lunchtime at the, at the end of some table, the way you do on many campuses today. Uh, all the black students I knew had white roommates. Uh, and, and I would say that the, most, the ones that I knew were, were all popular uh, other, other than me. Uh, but uh, uh, that's not the situation today. So what's causing it? The fact that you do have those little elites who have their agenda. It's the fact that the black students are forced to come out and do, and do the demonstrations and the whatnot. Uh, the fact that you have students there who are tremendously uh, alienated because they suddenly find themselves in this situation where academically they're, it's all they can do to keep their noses above the water, if they can do that. And then there's someone there to tell them that this is all due to the white power structure. And then there are the white students who are sick of hearing that. And they say, if you can't hack it, that's your problem. Don't, don't, don't give us this, this, this junk. And then that's called insensitivity. It's also, it's self-reinforcing. You know, there are some reactions that are self-equilibrating, but there's some that, that keep feeding each other. Let's say an ugly racial incident happens on campus at one of the elite colleges. Invariably, the first thing that will be said is we must have now a larger quota of minority students, a larger quota of minority faculty, and we must now subject the white students to these uh, sensitivity courses or ethnic courses or what have you courses that they've rejected taking, otherwise they wouldn't, wouldn't be necessary to force them. That is not going to make things better. That's going to make them worse. But as they get worse, then you keep doing that. And so it's just an upward spiral. And I just don't know where that spiral is going to end. I don't see anybody with the courage to end it. And I see it uh, leading only to bad things.